and I'm very excited to be talking to you virtually at the Fort Collins Comic Con. We've got hopefully an interesting science talk for you today where we're going to be talking about the science of optics. Optics is a pretty neat thing that I've devoted nine years of my life to studying and I'm glad to share some of that with you tonight or today, whenever you watch this. <laughs> so if I were to tell you optics, what's the first thing that you think of? A lot of you are probably thinking about eyeglasses as the first thing that uh, you would think of when it comes to optics. You might think of uh, you know, an ophthalmologist, that person who very patiently helps you try on multiple frames at the, the glasses store. But it's true that there is optics there, undeniably. There's lenses involved. And at the ophthalmologist, you might be using a lot of equipment that an optical engineer like myself designed like that thing that flips on is one or two, one or two, that, that whole thing. So that certainly is optics, but uh, that's a small slice of what we do as optical engineers. The next thing you might think of is lasers, which is true. Uh, I made quite a, I've made quite a few lasers during my time in optics, but uh, it's a lot more than just lasers. You also might think of something like the Hubble Space Telescope, all of the mirrors on it, the detectors, all of the other advanced instruments on it that have taken really, really cool pictures of our galaxy, which that is also true, but optics is also a lot more than that even still. So optics is the internet. You may have heard of fiber optics before, but these fiber optics, which are usually about the width of a human hair, very, very small pieces of glass, these pieces of glass carry incredibly fast data through light, blinking along the course of that fiber billions of times per second. And encoded in all of those blinks is perhaps this very video that you're watching over the internet. Um, or any time you're on social media, all that stuff is happening due to these optical fibers. There are fiber optic cables that are stretched between continents, um, often wrapped in Kevlar so sharks don't bite them. Uh, but without fiber optic cable, we would not have the incredibly fast internet speeds that we have today. In some places, like here in Longmont, you can even have the fiber delivered directly to your house and plugged into your router. But Oftentimes, there's still a little bit of copper wiring left between you and the beautiful, vast networks of glass, tiny, tiny glass cables that carry the internet's information. Optics is computers. Now, when Apple or Samsung or Google or whoever it is comes out with a new smartphone and everyone praises them for how incredibly fast it is, uh, what you may not know is up the chain of a few companies from Apple are companies like ASML or Symer that they are the ones that use light to pattern the computer chips with devices like this uh, device you see on the screen. All of these tiny chips have optical patterns that are projected onto them to help form the tiny transistors and the tiny circuits. So without light, we would not have the really fast computers that we have today. It's advancements in light and really, really short wavelengths that enable these really, really tiny little transistors that we can have on our computers now. It's pretty neat. Optics is energy. So anywhere, we have a good number of solar panels here in Colorado, but I come from Arizona originally, and we had tons of them there because we have more sunlight than we know what to do with in the state of Arizona. <laughs> Knowing how to understand how to take light that would normally just be heating up a patch of sand or heating up your car in the parking lot and turning it into useful clean energy is a pretty important skill right now. And also trying to make these things be more affordable or more energy efficient so that way they are more impactful are also a big part of uh, what optics people do. 
I know several friends who spent their whole PhD work just working on solar cell. Optics is making health accessible. Now, if you've ever seen on the back of a smartwatch, either your own Apple Watch or someone else's, uh, it's got a set of little lights on the back. And if you take them off shortly after it's been on your skin, you'll see it kind of blinking the screen color. And there's two, there's two colors on the back. There's the green color, which is what we see. And the other ones are infrared, which is a longer wavelength than our eyes can see. And they're doing two different things. The green is able to pick up your, your pulse because that green is picking up a certain part of your blood that as it goes by, it can see the changes in density in your blood through uh, the pumping of your heart. And that's how it can read your heart rate. So little things like that um, are ways that optics makes health accessible to you. The very display that you're looking at this on is the result of optics. On your screen, there are these tiny, tiny little pixels or picture elements. That's where the word pixel come from. It's a concatenation of picture element because it's the smallest portion of your camera or of your screen. On that, there are these little tiny lines of red, green, and blue light that add up to give you all of the information that you see, all of those various pixels that are help rendering my face and my presentation are the result of optics, whether you're seeing this on a projector or seeing this on your smartphone screen at home. And uh, yeah, now everyone's into those folding screens. It's the hot new display thing, that and uh, OLEDs. Organic LEDs, those are a big hot display thing right now. Optics is certainly very involved in the defense industry, either in satellites or in laser weapons like this system. This is the LAWS laser weapon system that is on a couple of Navy ships. And there's some neat videos you can watch online of these ships getting uh, some target practice on unmanned drones that these lasers are in, are also in the infrared, so they're invisible to our eyes. So to our eyes, the drone's just kind of flying along doing its thing and it suddenly bursts into flames. <laughs> um, but it's, it's very effective. You don't have to lead your target with a laser because the uh, speed of light is very fast. <laughs> Optics is also very involved in other medicinal things. Um, this, for example, is a pill that is small enough that you can swallow it and can take pictures of your digestive tract in perhaps a more comfortable method than uh, other methods of looking at your colon. Uh, also, optics is involved in uh, quite a variety of things in medicine. For example, in my PhD research, I was very involved in pancreatic cancer research that uh, I'll tell you about a little bit later on in this presentation. Um, there's, I know quite a few friends that helped design endoscopes that could do non-surgical cancer checks, um, ways of looking at melanoma on your skin to see how cancerous it is without having to do a biopsy. Pretty cool things like that. Optics is also very involved in industry as well, whether it's checking to see if a part has been manufactured correctly using very precise cameras that can see the edges of things, or whether it's things like this device, a laser cutter that can make very precise machining, um, not just of cutting things, but of shaping parts as well. Uh, there are 3D printers that use lasers to uh, melt metal together and make very, very complex metal shapes. So optics has been very transformative in that industry as well. But broadly, optics is a branch of physics. It's, we want to understand how light works. We look at the math, we do the simulations, we write out lots of equations, we try and understand why does light behave the way that it does. But optical engineers, which is a branch of engineering you may not have heard of, optical engineers try and take that knowledge and they try to apply it to make useful technology and lots of interesting uh, fun devices like whatever you're watching this on. 
Now, light is kind of a complex thing to think about, hence why I studied it as long as I did. So what we experience as light is actually a pretty small slice of what's the larger electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is everything that you're seeing here. The infrared that you feel when you're standing near a fire, that uh, you feel the warmth coming off of it, that's infrared light. The, if uh, you're a fan of listening to the radio in your car, the radio frequencies that are doing that, when you microwave your food, uh, when you get an x-ray, it's all ultraviolet, it's all electromagnetic radiation. But we experience a very, very small slice of that, which is what that visible um, slice showing you there is. And in our eyes, the way we experience that is that we have three main detectors. Um, they're called cones. One detects mostly red, one detects mostly blue, and the other detects mostly green. There's some overlap between them. So that's why in a camera or in a sensor, you only need a few main colors. And what better way at a Comic-Con to talk about these different colors than with a lightsaber. <laughs> Let me turn my light down here. Yes. So all you need is red, green, or blue. And these can mix depending on uh, you're in the dark side. <laughs> these, this lightsaber can only do one, one color at a time. So. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, so we have some more demos that I want to show you and talk to you about, about colors. So what you see with your eyes, you see all of those colors at once. It's difficult to, you can't really look at a light source with your eyes and understand what is making those colors. But fortunately, there are devices that exist that help us with that. Now, if we were here in person, I would pass out these snazzy glasses that you could wear that would help you to uh, see all of this for yourself. But fortunately, I can just kind of put these up to my camera here and you can experience the same thing. So if I were to hold this up to the camera, you probably can't quite see too much going on because there's not a light source pointed directly at you. But Let's see if I take my smartphone here. So this is the flashlight on my smartphone. You can just see the white light, but now what if, yeah, suddenly there's a rainbow there. Or on these glasses, which is even more dramatic. Yeah, there we go. All right, so now, suddenly there are these rainbows popping out everywhere and there's kind of a, a ghostly copy of me in front of uh, <laughs> right next to it. So what these glasses do is these glasses take the, this light and they spread it out into that spectrum, just like I was showing you on uh, my presentation. Inside this white light, um, when you see white light, that means it has all of the other colors in it. And these glasses just help to spread it out so you can see where my phone is that there's still kind of the, the original white yellowish color, but now there's all of these rainbows spreading off from it. So we can learn some very interesting things just by looking at color. So let me show you what I mean. So this, this is a compact fluorescent light bulb. And before LEDs, they were a great step forward in having more energy efficient light sources. And I've got an LED bulb here that I'll switch out on this lamp. Looks pretty similar, other than the fact that the shape of the LED bulb is more typical to a normal light bulb or an incandescent light bulb back in the old days. So the reason we don't like incandescent light bulbs is because incandescent light bulbs 
uh, give off a lot of light into the infrared because they get so hot. And since our eyes can't see the infrared, that's not useful energy as a light bulb. You know, a light bulb is meant for us to see. <laughs> so if it's giving off light that we can't see with our eyes, then it's not as useful of a tool. Now, despite how similar these looked in white light, once you put these glasses on, you'll find they look very different. So this, the, on this compact fluorescent bulb, it's a little bit easier to see on the ones on the side. It looks like there's discrete colors. There's kind of, uh, you can see the shape of the light bulb repeated several times with, you can kind of see a clear purple line, a clear green, a clear reddish color. Huh, interesting. Let's look at the LED light bulb. My very, very advanced demonstration to a lamp without its lampshade. <laughs> now we've got the LED light. Hmm. And this looks pretty different. There's a more smooth smear of colors off of the LED light bulb compared to the compact fluorescent light bulb. And in fact, the light on my phone is the same. The light on my phone is also an LED light bulb. And we'll hold that up again. And you can see that same effect. Actually, if you're paying really close attention, you can see that there's kind of a, a brighter blue spot, and then it gets a little bit dimmer, and then it spreads out into the rest of the colors. You can kind of see that towards the top of the screen there. So the way that uh, these two bulbs make light is very, very different. In the compact fluorescent bulb, inside this little curly tube is mercury gas. And uh, this whitish stuff on the outside is a special type of material that absorbs the light off of that, the mercury and gives off a more white color, a more broad spectrum. So mercury is any element, we'll talk about this more in a little bit, any element when you excite it will give off a distinct set of colors. So mercury is giving off those set of colors you kind of saw in the shape of the bulb. And these colors are very useful for us as scientists to understand what sort of light source something is or when looking at other planets. So on this mercury bulb, take a look at it one more time with my glasses. This mercury bulb, yeah, you can see those distinct, more distinct colors coming off of it. So that's how the mercury bulb works. The LED bulb is different. So this is a, a dead LED bulb. So I just kind of took off the cap. The lid for this is just to help kind of make the light be more uniform. But uh, let me hold this up to the camera. Change my focus here so you can see a little better. So the inside of this light bulb is all of these little yellow dots are the actual LEDs. They're very small. And that yellow color on top, is kind of like in the mercury bulb, there's actually a blue LED underneath this. And that blue LED is being absorbed by this yellowish color material. And that yellowy material is then emitting the rest of the colors that we need to see white light. Pretty neat. All right, I'm back in focus. <laughs> all right, since we've just talked about all of that interesting color stuff. Oh, and you might, uh, you might wonder about a laser because this laser is just one color. Now on the laser, you're just gonna see that same color repeated a bunch of times. Or I could just shine it right through. Yeah, I'm just shining it now right through the glasses. 
So now you can kind of see the overall pattern of how this, uh, these diffraction glasses or this diffraction pattern are working. So let me go back to my presentation here. And get that up on the screen again. So color can tell you quite a lot of interesting things. So that we just looked at all those light bulbs and we saw that the, the colors that come off of the LED light bulb look very different than the colors that come off of the compact fluorescent light bulb. But we can do even more than that uh, with colors, with kind of more advanced versions of these tools. So these glasses are fun and they, you know, you put them on, you see a thousand rainbows and especially, especially for the kids, it's always fun to hand these out and watch their minds get blown. But at scientists, there's actually a whole field of examining colors within optics called spectroscopy of looking at the light spectrum to understand um, what is giving off light in different places. So for example, uh, this is a picture of the sun during a solar eclipse. And during the solar eclipse, you can see the coronasphere around the sun. And these lines here on the screen are these specific atomic lines that are for each of these elements. So these elements on the periodic table, they all have a distinctive set of colors that they give off when they um, have electricity running through them, like in the case of the compact fluorescent light bulb or when they're hot. And the reason they give off distinct colors is because they have distinct uh, atomic structures on the periodic table. So one day in 1868, a French astronomer was looking at the sun with this device, sort of like these glasses, but a, a spectrometer that uh, does split the light off into its multiple lines, but you know, in a more precise scientific way than just fun glasses you can wear on your face. And he looked up at the sun and he could pick out this set of lines that he had never seen before. And so he realized there must be another element that we're not aware of. And so he called the element helium after the Greek word helios for the sun. So we discovered the existence of helium, not from uh, having a balloon that we sucked the air out and our voice went really high, but because a smart guy was looking up at the colors coming off of the sun and realized there must be a new element. Pretty neat. So we use this all the time in astronomy or in uh, other planet sciences. This is a picture of the Curiosity rover. And on its masthead, the Curiosity rover has an infrared laser, not a red laser like drawn here, but an infrared laser that it can use to zap rocks that are out of reach. And based on the colors coming off of that rock, it can learn things about what that rock is made of. Very helpful since it's a rover and it can only reach so far to have the extended reach that comes with this tool. Colors can also tell us things about the expansion of the universe. So these colors that I showed you are the same whether sodium is on this planet or on another planet, but if you've ever heard of the Doppler shift where you know, you've got a siren coming towards you and it's high pitched and then it goes past you and now it gets lower pitched. The same thing happens with light. So light is also a wave. And if a planet is moving towards us, it's kind of the same thing as the Doppler shift. If a planet that has a lot of sodium on it, say, that's giving off a lot of that sodium line comes towards us, we can recognize that sodium line, but it's going to be at a shorter wavelength than we're used to seeing it. And so by looking at that color, you can tell if a planet or a star, for example, is moving away from you. So in the graphic here, what we're seeing in the middle is the normal where the light, if we were to look at our own sun, these are kind of the colors that we would see. The black lines are from various things that absorb colors like our atmosphere or other uh, things in between us and the, the sun. And if 
those that distinctive pattern of dark lines is shifted towards the blue, then okay, that star is moving towards us. If it's shifted towards the red, then okay, that star is moving away from us. It's a very useful tool for astronomers to uh, be able to just look at colors and understand these sort of things. All right, so I have a few more things about optics that I wanna sh uh, share with you. So we're going to take a look at some demos I have here off to the side. So bear with me as I uh, adjust my camera for that. All right. Get my light. Okay, so I have a couple little demos over here just to give uh, some more explanation into some optics words you may have heard before. So we have a couple pieces of, of uh, plastic here acting as lenses. So this one is going to be a uh, positive lens. So for example, if you're farsighted and you have a hard time seeing things up close, you might have a, a lens that looks like this and cross section in your glasses. And if you're nearsighted and you have a hard time seeing things far away, you might have a, a lens with this shape that's got what we call a negative lens. And I have a couple little light sources here that uh, give me some little lines. All right, those showing up on camera, great. So we saw with the diffraction glasses that the color of light can affect the way that light behaves. And we're going to see that again here. So this is just a little prism of glass here. So light moves in a straight line unless it runs into something. So here we have this. Uh, piece of plastic here that if I send the red light through in a straight line, it goes through straight. But as I adjust it, oh, some interesting things are happening here. If the light were going in a straight line, the red line would be coming out more in this area. But instead, it's coming off more to the side. Bring my brightness down here. Show up a little bit better. Okay, yeah, that's a little bit easier to see. So this is what we call refraction. Light is running into this material, and as light interacts with that material, it is bending the direction that the light is going. At the end of the day, that's kind of how a lens works. We get light to do what we want by using a piece of glass that has a certain shape to it, and we can get light to focus down by having a negative, a positive lens, or we can get the light to spread out more by having a negative lens. And an interesting feature about this is that generally the red light will bend less than the blue light. If you've ever seen pictures of prisms or like the famous Pink Floyd album that's got the uh, spectrum in it. If we have these two colors more or less hitting this straight on, you can see that the blue light is curving at a stronger angle than the red light. And that has to do with the wavelength dependence of light interacting with objects like this. All right, lots more that I, I wish I could take your questions on live as I'm doing this presentation, but uh, you know, here we are in a pandemic, so. <laughs> All right, let me uh, reset my camera for my little set over here.
Okay, and then, you know, even the camera that I'm recording this on is uh, all the result of optics. Okay, so let's get back to my presentation here. We just talked about colors and how they can uh, tell us about the universe. You might be asking yourself, how do you learn about optics? It, it's not really a, a discipline you hear about very often. Well, there are a couple of places around the US that have degrees in optical sciences. I happen to get mine from the University of Arizona College of Optical Sciences. The, we ended up in Arizona because it's a great place for astronomy. And so the guy who founded our program, Aiden Minel, was out in Tucson for astronomy. We get a lot of clear nights, so a good place to look at the stars. And uh, the Air Force wanted to have a place where more people could understand how to build spy satellites. And so the College of Optical Sciences was founded back in 64. And now we have uh, a very large program in uh, both for undergraduate students and graduate students to study optics. I learned about optics myself as a high school student. I went to a career fair where students from my college were attending, and I already knew that LASER was an acronym, Light Amplification by the Stimulated Emission of Radiation. And I understood how polarized sunglasses work, so they hunted me down with a flyer and they said, you need to go to our summer camp. And uh, this is me in 2009 at the summer camp trying to figure out how a, uh, the little flip on a rear view mirror, what it actually does. <laughs> As an undergraduate student, I did work in 3D holographic displays or a display that allows you to see a 3D image without needing to wear glasses like a, a 3D movie in your home or in a theater. So that was pretty cool. It involved using lasers to write a pattern in a very special mixture of materials. Uh, pretty neat. I wish I could show it to you in person. It really is very striking to be able to move your head side to side and see this uh, 3D object with your own eyes. And in graduate school, I worked on designing and using a very special type of microscope called a multi-photon microscope. And in grad school, it was a lot of the design and seeing what kind of neat things you could do with it. For example, um, this is showing how I designed one of the microscopes of starting with how does the light behave using an optical software that simulates how light behaves. And then I laid out all of the parts to make sure they would all fit together. And then I actually built it and tried to see how it worked. <laughs> So what makes this microscope so fancy? So if I say microscope, this is probably the kind of thing that you think of either from a, a course you had in college or maybe in high school, you might have used a microscope like this to in a biology class. So in this microscope, it has the eyepieces that you would look through with your eye and it's got a light bulb in the back to shine white light into your sample, little stage for you to move around and see the different positions on the sample, and a microscope objective that helps to serve to magnify what the object is. Now this microscope is really only good for magnifying stuff. It doesn't really tell you, it doesn't give you additional information about what is inside the tissue. So these are two different pictures of a slice from the brain of a mouse. And the one on the left is just kind of a raw slice from the mouse. It hasn't really been cut really thin for looking at under a microscope. They haven't put a contrast stain on it. And the image on the right is from a thin slice of a mouse brain that this very common stain called H&E that uh, helps you to pick out the different portions of the brain. So a lot of microscopy and a decent amount of medicine still relies on this, of having to cut very thin slices of uh, tissue that you're trying to look at to understand what it's made of or what, if it's cancerous perhaps, or any other disease that um, you can't really tell just from the white tissue because 
you know, if you look at your hand, um, there's just not a lot of contrast. There's a lot of different kind of things underneath your skin, but uh, it's hard for you to see that without um, some other way of picking out that information. Now, my microscope that I worked with in grad school makes pretty rainbow colored pictures like this. This picture is actually four different sets of information that have been overlaid on each other in false color. So we colored one set of information green and one set of information red, and we added all the information on top just so it's a little bit easier for us to see um, all of that information at once. And this tissue would normally look like just that white stuff or that kind of blurry white stuff, you know, if you're a white guy like me um, on the microscope. But this is a mouse's pancreas that has cancer. And in pancreatic cancer, your main hope for survival is surgical removal because it's very difficult to detect this cancer early on. It's usually you don't experience symptoms with pancreatic cancer until it's already very late stage. Um, and because the, of how the pancreas is, is constructed, it doesn't usually respond well to chemotherapy. So it's a lot, the, your best hope for survival is surgical removal. And if you can manage to get all of the cancer, your odds of survival are actually very good. Um, in one particular study, um, if they managed to get all of the cancer out and they had a clean margin between where they cut out the tissue and where the clean tissue began, um, all the patients lived, uh, most of the patients lived past five years. If they missed any of it, none of them lived past two years. So it's a, it's a very tough cancer, which is part of the reason why we worked on it. Um, so in this image, you can kind of very clearly see that there's a difference between the top portion of the image and the bottom portion, that suddenly there's just kind of a line where the kind of a thick green line where there's mostly blue stuff underneath it and mostly other color things above it. So with the help of our doctor friends, our medical doctor friends, we know that the top portion of this image is the healthy portion of the pancreas and the portion below it is the cancerous portion of the pancreas. And with this image, we didn't have to do anything special to this tissue. We could just put the mouse tissue underneath my microscope and my microscope could take these really cool pictures. So this is, I told you about this earlier in the presentation. This is an example of optics in medicine and the cool things that we can do with divine, designing devices like these that uh, can be very impactful to the field of medicine. So yeah, that's one of the fun things I got to do in grad school. So currently, um, I work for Ball Aerospace as an optical engineer working on large uh, telescope missions. You might have heard of the James Webb Space Telescope that's going up into space uh, around the end of this year. I didn't work on that personally, but I know a lot of cool people who did. And that's going to be able to look into really deep infrared that Hubble can't just because of the cameras it has. It doesn't look into the deep infrared. So James Webb is going to be able to look at much longer wavelengths that help it to see through particles and dusty areas and learn more about the older days of the universe. Um, I work on a telescope called the Roman Space Telescope that uh, is going to be like Hubble, but it has uh, more than 100 times the field of view of Hubble. So it's going to be able to capture a lot more information at once. So. Uh, and there's a lot of other things you can do with optics as uh, an optical engineer. So you can, um, for example, if you wanted to say, so say, say you're a younger person watching this and you thought about being an engineer and you want to be an electrical engineer, but there's a lot of overlap between optics and what the electronics people need to do. For example, this is the front of the iPhone 10 from the original keynote when they were first introducing the iPhone 10. And there's a whole list of things on the front of that uh, camera in that little notch area. And some of these you can probably guess have to do with optics, but all of these circled areas depend very heavily on optics. 
um, the way that the face ID works, it's pretty interesting. There's a couple of pictures. The way that the face ID works is that these pictures are in the infrared and it projects uh, millions, or I think it's about 30,000 dots, 30,000 laser dots across your face that it uses to see what the construction of your face is. And you can see it very clearly, especially in the picture of the right, the lady holding the phone and all of the dots on her face. So there's both the projector for all of those dots that puts it on your face. And then there's the camera that picks up all of that, as well as the selfie camera, as well as the little sensor that turns your screen off when you hold it up to your face. So there's a lot going on. Say you were interested in being a mechanical engineer. Well, certainly in the construction of a really nice camera lens, like the one you see off to the side there, there's a lot of very, very fine mechanics on holding those lenses. As you twist a zoom lens, there's a very complex dance of these lenses that need to have just the right spacing so that the zoom on the lens increases, but everything still stays in focus and it still is a nice image quality picture. So there's, uh, there's a lot of mechanical engineering involved in that. Um, or for example, on the James Webb Space Telescope, this thing has to survive being launched into space inside this rocket, getting vibrated half to death um, because of all the forces of that rocket. And so mechanical engineers are very important to understanding how to build all of these mirrors and these optical assemblies to hold everything together. There's also the field of material science that is understanding how to make things like metals or plastics. I told you about that, the lab that I worked in as an undergrad in 3D holographic displays. And this particular orange stuff that you see is kind of an unassuming mixture of materials, but that mixture of materials is what allows us to make a 3D image like uh, the one that you're seeing on the screen. So uh, understanding how light is going to interact with materials is very, very important, such as like that uh, image I was showing you of refraction of the red and green light, the red and blue light rather, focusing through that positive lens. Um, with material science, we can understand how much different, the angle of the red light and the blue light is going to be based on what kind of material that uh, little piece of plastic is made of, or whatever material it is. So optical sciences is, uh, and optics is a really interesting field of study and uh, very, very exciting, uh, at least for me. I mean, I studied it for a long time and now I do it as a career. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this brief introduction to the science of optics. Uh, if you have any questions about the talk or about optics, or if you're interested in seeing about it as a career, feel free to shoot me an email. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much to the folks at the Fort Collins Comic Con for the invitation to give this presentation. Uh, I love getting to tell people about this uh, cool field of science and and yeah, it's just a lot of fun to talk about. It's always fun to show, show off those cool colors and tell you all about this neat field of science. So thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it if you made it all the way here to the end of the video. And uh, keep being curious, keep asking questions, and live long and prosper.